A month-long lockdown starts to ease today in Wuhan, the Chinese city where the coronavirus outbreak was first reported. The city's drastic measures have served as a model for countries battling the coronavirus around the world. After 11 weeks, Chinese authorities are now allowing residents of Wuhan more freedom of movement. This milestone comes as China reported no new deaths on Tuesday. It's about time. As the clock struck midnight in Wuhan, one of the major lockdown measures was removed, outbound travel. An impressive light show marked the occasion, featuring health workers and the words heroic city. Others weren't pausing to celebrate. Instead, thousands of travellers flocked to catch trains or take advantage of removed roadblocks. I feel great. The epidemic has maybe stabilised to some extent, so we're able to travel now. Wuhan has lost a lot in this epidemic, and its people have paid a big price. Now that the lockdown has been lifted, I think we're all pretty happy. It's the city where the coronavirus outbreak began. Many people have been trapped for more than two months. They will leave Wuhan to rejoin friends, family and return to work. I came back before Lunar New Year and planned to stay for a few days. It wasn't even two days and it was announced Wuhan would be locked down and I couldn't leave, so I've been stuck here the whole time. The easing of the lockdown comes as China reported no new coronavirus deaths for the first time since it started publishing figures. But authorities still urge caution. Zero new COVID-19 cases does not mean zero risk. The lifting of the lockdown does not mean the lifting of epidemic prevention and control. Wuhan has been breathing a tentative sigh of relief. More shops are open and there are more people on the street. Though a return to normality in Wuhan appears far off. Various restrictions on movement within the sprawling metropolis will remain in place to guard against a second wave of infections. So let's bring in correspondent Fabian Kretschmer, who is joining us from Beijing. Fabian, so it's not a complete return to normal, is it? No, no, it's far from normal. Um, what we see here is that, um, of course, the streets are filling up, uh, but mostly are still empty. Uh, restaurants, uh, some of them are open now, but yeah, also empty. Uh, we see, for example, now there are fishers again at the Yangtze River that flows through the city. That's uh, yeah, normal. And for many residents, it feels normal. But of course, a pre-virus uh, compared with that, then it's not normal at all. The big change today is that some people are allowed to um, leave the city. Uh, that means um, if they have a, a green QR code, um, every resident is given a QR code um, depending on their health status. And uh, if you are green, uh, that means you don't belong to any health uh, uh, risk group, then you are allowed to uh, leave the city. But within the city, of course, many of the restrictions of movement are still in place. And uh, that's also because um, the responsibility for new infections in China is actually delegated to the lower level. So uh, the neighborhood committees, the, the property managements of residential compounds and also the companies are, uh, can be held ac accountable if new infections break out. So they actually take it very seriously. You have to report um, to your neighborhood committee before you um, leave your compound and then really tell them where you're going. And mm. it's strongly encouraged that you only do necessary things. So given all of that, how are people reacting to the relaxation of the curfew? Uh, they're very euphoric, very happy. I mean, one resident that I interviewed, he told me that uh, the moment that he, that he left um, his compound, his residential compound for the first time in over two months, um, he took selfies and sent them to all of his friends because he really just wanted to share his joy. And then he headed uh, to the supermarket and uh, straight to the section of sweets and chocolate bars and all that because uh, in the last two months, of course, the necessities were all taken care of. Um, he was supplied rice, um, vegetables and even uh, meat. But, you know, all those sweets for his children were the first in over two months. So, yeah, definitely it's it's a very emotional. But actually many residents also that I spoke to, they are still afraid of a second wave of infections. Mm. So they are really, um, yeah, not really easily going out but want to stay home. How high is that fear, Fabian? Because, I mean, the coronavirus is, is by no means defeated, as you've highlighted. 
yeah, actually, it's it's only a matter of time until the the infections will rise again. We know that actually within Wuhan, the the testing, uh, the virus testing has been increased. Um, now there are uh, up to twelve thousand virus tests a day again. So that means also there will be much more asymptomatic um, carriers of the virus, um, persons who are infected, but. Uh, who don't show any symptoms, I think that number will increase. And um, it's basically trial and error, right? Every uh, decision that is now made in, in Wuhan can be also turned back. So I think uh, they really want to, like in, in an experiment, they want to try, um, can they open it? Will the numbers go, uh, go up or not? And then they can uh, take it from one step at a time. Correspondent Fabian Kretschmer in Beijing, thank you. And let's now get you the latest developments on the coronavirus pandemic. The global death toll from COVID-19 is now more than 82,000, with more than 1.4 million confirmed infections since the outbreak began. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has spent his second night in intensive care. He is said to be in a stable condition and not on a ventilator. And the head of the EU's top science organization has resigned. Mauro Ferrari says that he faced institutional and political obstacles while trying to swiftly set up a scientific program to combat the virus. And a global condom shortage is looming due to the virus lockdown measures in major production hubs like Malaysia. The UN warns of devastating public health consequences. New York is still reporting sharply rising casualties from the virus. The death toll has now climbed above 4,000, many more than died in the 9-11 attacks. The state reported its biggest one-day jump in fatalities on Tuesday. Hospitals remain overstretched, but Governor Andrew Cuomo insists that the number of deaths is leveling off. He says that this shows social distancing is working. Meanwhile, President Donald Trump has threatened to freeze funding for the World Health Organization. At his daily White House briefing, Trump criticized the WHO's handling of the crisis, saying that the UN body was, quote, China-centric. They called it wrong. They call it wrong. They really, they missed the call. They could have called it months earlier. They would have known. And uh, they should have known. And they probably did know. So we'll be looking into that very carefully. And we're going to put a hold on money spent to the WHO. We're going to put a very powerful hold on it. And we're going to see. It's a great thing if it works. But when they call every shot wrong, that's no good. And DW correspondent Oliver Salad has been following the story in Washington. We asked him about Trump's reasons for attacking the WHO. President Trump uh, is uh, essentially uh, saying that he will put a hold on the U.S. funding to the World Health Organization. That's a very bold move. Um, you heard the sound, but he said they missed the call. So, And he's partially right because the World Health Organization was, in fact, late uh, calling the corona crisis a pandemic. Um, they also were protective with regards to China in the beginnings of the pandemic. Um, but it really looks like President Trump uh, is really trying to blame uh, the WHO for his own um, for his own acting in this crisis because he's taking a lot of heat recently for acting late. So uh, the U.S. has turned uh, into the epicenter um, of the corona pandemic, as we know. And President Trump was very reluctant in the first place to act quickly to take this uh, threat seriously also. And it looks like he's now trying to punish the World Health Organization. And that uh, very well uh, also fits to his rhetoric. And that is don't blame me, blame the WHO and blame China. That was Oliver Salad in Washington. Across the Atlantic, world leaders have been sending get well soon messages to Britain's prime minister, who has spent his second night in an intensive care unit. Boris Johnson is said to be in a stable condition, conscious and not on a ventilator. The UK leader spent 10 days in isolation after testing positive for the coronavirus. He was hospitalized on Sunday evening with a high fever. However, his condition deteriorated a day later. Let's bring in correspondent Birgit Mass, who is standing by in London for us. So, Birgit, what more do we know about his condition right now? Well, we are really waiting uh, for a fresh update, and I think a lot of British people would be really very, very conscious about what's going on and, and would really want to know how he's doing. A second night in hospital, he's being closely monitored. The latest information that he's not on a ventilator, that's of course good news. But yes, we're waiting um, as to, you know, how if his condition is, is, is still stable. And people in, in Britain are of course 
continuing to send wishes and, and prayers that he might get better. And how has the government been working so far without um, the prime minister at the helm there? Well, we have got Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab. He is uh, being given the instruction from the Prime Minister how to steer the country, how to handle the crisis. But it has emerged that um, he is not, doesn't really have the capability to make his own decisions. He was in a press conference um, on Tuesday and he was very evasive when he was being asked, well, what happens if you um, need, to, need to make a, a tough decision? How are you going to do it? And he kept saying it's then due to the cabinet, we are doing this as a cabinet, we're doing this together, but it seems like there might be a little bit uh, of a vacuum and even conservative um, peace, co uh, conservative members of parliament have said, well, we need to really be sure that, for example, when it comes to national security, that there is clarity. So at the moment, it really seems that the prime minister is missing in this crucial, this crucial point in, in British history, really. Let's talk about the broader public. Um, where is Britain on the curve right now? Because we have the death toll in the UK rising above 6,000. Is there any sign of the outbreak peaking? No, it's too early to say. So the experts have been very, very cautiously op optimistic. They said there could be signs that the curve is flattening, but it's really too early to say. So, for example, they were going to discuss just uh, easing the restrictions on the lockdown as early as next week. So that might not happen um, because they really need to see more cle clear evidence that these um, social distancing, that these measures are working in the UK at the moment. It's still a, a very, very toll that the country is paying uh, due to the virus. Birgit Mass in London. Thank you, Birgit. Well, with the coronavirus still claiming lives and paralyzing societies all over the world, it might not seem the right moment to talk about lifting lockdowns. But Denmark is about to begin doing just that. The government's reasoning for the move, the number of COVID-19 patients in hospitals is beginning to fall. The message from our health ministry is that it is reasonable and appropriate to begin a controlled reopening of the country. But it comes with conditions that we all continue to keep our distance, wash our hands and avoid groups of people. Denmark's borders will remain closed until at least the 10th of May. And the ban on large events and festivals will stay in place until the end of August. Lufthansa has become the first major airline group to announce permanent cuts to its operations driven by the coronavirus crisis. The company is closing budget airline group German Wings and decommissioning more than 40 aircraft. The German carrier says that it doesn't expect demand for air travel to return to pre-coronavirus levels for years to come. It also is planning to reduce the fleets of its subsidiaries, Austrian Airlines, Swiss and Eurowings. Financial correspondent Conrad Buzen joins us now from Frankfurt, where Lufthansa happens to be headquartered. Welcome to you, Conrad. Um, is it likely that Lufthansa is simply the first of many carriers to take moves like this? Uh, well, you know, Sarah, even before the coronavirus grounded the airline fleets worldwide, the sector had large overcapacities, too many airplanes flying around half full and not very profitably. And only very few airlines have the financial power to stand through such a lockdown longer. IATA, the International Airlines Association, estimates that only 30 of its 300 members have the financial powers to survive um, more than two months without being in operation. So it's very, very likely that Lufthansa is only the first among many, among many airlines to announce that it has to shrink permanently. So what does this mean for the industry? I mean, what would it take for airlines that have grounded their flights um, for them to fly again? 
Well, of course, the first thing they need is passengers, people that want to travel by plane, something which is not easy while all the international travel restrictions are underway. Something that also would probably help airlines is a more generous handling of all the claims for cancelled flights that they have to handle right now. A generous handling, of course, from the point of view uh, from uh, the airlines. Uh, the, the amount of claims is huge and the amount of money to handle, of course, as well. So many knock-on effects from this virus. Conrad Busen in Frankfurt, thank you.